Ryan grew up in Janesville, then attended UW-Whitewater where he earned his undergraduate degree in elementary education and his master's in curriculum and construct instruction. <laughs> Not construction, sorry. <laughs> he was on the Warhawk baseball team during his entire college career and placed third place in the Division III College World Series. Ryan was then signed by the San Francisco Giants and played parts of four years in the Giants and Minnesota Twins organizations. After his playing days, he began work at UW-Whitewater's Academic Advising Center and is now the Director of Continuing Education Services, Camps and Conferences. Ryan still lives in Janesville with his wife and their two children with another due in October. Welcome, Ryan Callahan. Thank you, and Carrie, thanks for uh, inviting me, and obviously all of you, thanks for having me. Um, when Carrie approached me about this topic, I was a little, a little frightened, a little scared, because I don't consider myself a, a Ken Burns baseball historian. And I think Carrie made some good points, and she said, you went through it, who better to be a historian than somebody who is actually there and a part of it? So I think that kind of put me at ease. So first of all, I'm going to talk about before spring training and before the minor leagues, and just being an overall prospect. Like Carrie said, I grew up in Janesville. I was fortunate enough to have some great high school coaches at Janesville Parker. One of them is Dan Madden, who won hundreds and hundreds of games and coached a lot of players that were eventually went on to be uh, professional baseball players. Um, my tie to UW Whitewater was Jim Miller. Many of you may know his mother, uh, Lorraine Miller, who passed away a couple years ago. And he was the one who recruited me. And the, the funny story with, with Mills was, I have two older brothers, so my mom's kind of seen everything. We went into Mills' office, and he said, you know, Ryan, I think you can really play at the next level, and, you know, we would love to have you at Whitewater. We have a long tradition of uh, players that have played professional baseball, and one by the name of Bob Wickman. And this was when Bob Wickman was still playing. I think he was an all-star at the time with the uh, Cleveland Indians, and he was going to the World Series with the New York Yankees. And Bob Wickman, for those of you that don't know him, he's a right-handed pitcher, and he's missing half of his index finger. And he says, well, if everybody's going to be a major league baseball player, the quickest way would be to cut off their finger. <laughs> so my mom, again, had two older, two, I have two older brothers. She looks at me and says, where am I leaving my son? <laughs> so make a long story short, he sold me on not cutting off my finger, but attending UW Whitewater and, and helping and continuing my playing career after high school. So while I was there, I was fortunate to place with some really, really good players that were eventually prospects. So my freshman year in high school, or freshman year in college, I was, I'm not, I'm not very big as it is, but I was even smaller. So when Mills told me that I think I, you can play at the next level, I, I believed him, but at the same time, I didn't think I had the physical abilities or the physical size. So four years later, um, for some of you that are from Jefferson area might know the Endel family. Um, Brady Endel was the same grade as me. He was six foot five, left-handed, and threw the ball 90 miles an hour. So I was fortunate enough to play with him. So when the scouts wanted to go see him, they would see me too. So that was kind of a, a blessing to have Brady on the team as well. So I think he definitely uh, allowed me to get some, get some looks. So as we go forward, now we're, we're seniors, in high, seniors in college, and there's a lot of different things going on before the draft. Uh, many of you may be NFL fans, and there's the NFL Combine in Indianapolis every year. Well, in Major League Baseball, there's no Combine. There's just each team will say, I want you to try out at your field Monday at 4.30. Be there. I'll have a couple scouts there for you. So once we came to the senior year, I was, my velocity was pretty high. The magic number with baseball is about 90 miles an hour. If you can throw 90 miles an hour, you have a good shot of either signing a professional contract through the draft or a free agency. So I was right around there. Um, when we were in Florida my senior year, there's a couple games where I was actually pitching at around 92-93. So if, for any of you that are watching well, the Brewers or the Cubs, 92-93 is what those guys are throwing at. So when I was 22, 23 years old, that's where I was at. So I thought I was pretty hot stuff at the time. So, but I was still only 5'11", which never held my cause. But, so once we got done with our season, um, the draft was about three weeks after we, we lost in the, in the World Series on a walk-off home run. Extremely exciting game. Too bad we lost, but it was, a, it was a great game. And a lot of the scouts are calling you. And the scouts are salespeople. The scouts will say, Ryan, I got the 32nd pick in the draft. 
I'm going to get you with a 30-second pick if you're still available. Well, there's about 1,000, 2,000 players that are drafted before that pick, so you have no idea if you're going to be available or if somebody's going to have a change of heart. So one thing that I learned pretty quickly was that the scouts you just kind of take with a grain of salt. The first time I talked to a scout, my God, I was going to be a millionaire in three weeks. That's what I told my mom. I'm like, hey, I think I'm going to the first round. I think with the twins, uh, 2.5 2 is my goal. And then eventually reality kind of set in and all these calls, uh, the scouts started calling and they would say, okay, well, maybe in the 50th round. Well, there's only 50 rounds. I don't care. Just pick me. I'll pay you to come play. So the, the most exciting part of the pre-draft stuff was kind of the hoopla. You know, although I knew it was kind of, you know, taken with a grain of salt, I was 22 years old and I thought I was pretty, pretty big stuff and it was neat. It was a great feeling. You know, from the time I can remember, the one thing I want to do for the rest of my life was play baseball or play baseball. That was it. Then all of a sudden, now I'm getting calls from all these teams. I'm filling out these draft cards that say, you know, what's your aspirations? Well, what do you think my aspirations are? Play baseball. You know, so it's pretty easy. But the highlight was I got a call from one of the Brewer scouts, and he said, hey, we're having a pre-draft workout at Miller Park. You can be there at, at uh, I think it was like 9 o'clock a.m., and it'll go till 5 p.m. The Brewers were out of town, so I drive into the players' parking lot at Miller Park, which was a huge rush, and we go to the locker room. Uh, we have on our regular uniforms, and we go out there. We start doing our warm-ups, and all the Brewers scouts and the, the brass, the GM, and all their, their big wigs are sitting out there. Then they come up with the, uh, the lineup. So there's probably about 40 people there, right around 20 pitchers and then 20 position players there for the, the pre-draft workout. So that was just a thrill, walking into the county state, or uh, Miller Park, excuse me. Obviously nobody was there, but it was still pretty neat, you know, pitching. And then I got the roster and I got the order that I was pitching and I was pitching last. So I'm like, oh, well, I guess I'm not too high in their prospect total. But again, Brady Endo was there, so hey, you know, they probably chose me. They said, if I, you're taking Brady, you gotta take Ryan as well. But that was just a huge rush. And the, and the neatest part was just meeting some of the players. And these were all over, the Brewers spent I mean, they had to spend $500,000 on getting these kids all over the place, from Dallas, from Florida, California, New York. So they flew in their top guys that they were going to pick in the, in the uh, whatever, 2004 Major League Draft. So that was just a rush, just playing there. But again, I was realistic. I think I was a pretty humble person. So the draft came, and I think I wanted to get drafted, but I think there was a chance that it might be late. So... <laughs> Right after I got home from, from uh, or right after the season got over, I had to figure out what I was going to do because I'm an elementary ed major, so I had to student teach as well. So I had one more semester to student teach. I want to play professional baseball, and I got to get a summer job because my mom's not going to support me. So I got three things to figure out. Hopefully the baseball thing would just take, take care of it all. So I found a, a, a company that was hiring painters for the summer, which it was, a, it, was, it was a job. And the beauty of it, it was really raining, so we didn't work that much. <laughs> Um, so we, and I was fortunate to work with two of my buddies that I haven't seen from high school in probably five years since we, since we departed for college and all of us were in the same boat. So we, we start painting, we have a crew, it's a lot of fun, I think we're doing some pretty good work and again we're getting a lot of rain out so there's not a lot of work but eventually the draft came and I have my old cell phone with me the whole time and I'm hoping to get a call and day one, day one is rounds, I think it was one through ten. I figured it wasn't going to be down in day one, but maybe a scout would call me and say, hey, we got you, you know, slotted for the 40th round of the second day. So day two came, and uh, another beautiful day, and I, of course I'm checking my phone, and the phone never rings. So I was, I was crushed. I mean, like anybody, that was your dream. You were successful. You had these scouts telling you that you were going to be drafted in the 30th round, in the 40th round, in the 50th round, which, like I said, I would have paid them whatever they wanted just to play. So I was pretty heartbroken. Continued my painting career. I think it got even worse after that because I didn't want to be there and I thought I was going to be gone. But, uh, and then the next, about four or five days later, that's when I got the phone call. And I'm going to kind of talk about that one, that four or five day window. So there's 50 rounds in the major league draft. Everybody gets 50 picks. Some get more. It's like baseball or basketball and football. You can trade some draft picks, but more, more often than not, every team gets 50 picks. So, Within those 50 picks, not everybody's, not everybody's gonna sign. There could be a kid from Whitewater High School 
who's extremely talented, and he's taken with the 10th pick, and the Brewers are only going to offer him $2 million. Well, he wants to go, he wants to sign for $3 million, and if they don't do that, he's going to go to Florida to play college baseball. So within that 50 window range, there's probably only about 30 players that actually get signed. And those are, a lot of them are seniors, that, that's their last hope. I was a fifth year senior, I couldn't do anything else, I, I had no leverage. It's, it was it. Whatever, if they're going to sign me, I had to kind of abide by their terms and that was that. So that week window after the draft, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of signs are, are, are taking place, signees are taking place. Some people will strictly straight up say, you know what, no thank you, I want to go to Florida State and I'm going to play basketball or I'm going to play baseball and football, whatever it may be. Because every team, every minor, every major league team has about six or seven minor league teams and they got to, they got to fill those rosters up. Once they figure out how many players they're going to have a chance at signing, that's when the, the free agency starts. And that's where I fall into play. I was fortunate enough where enough Giants roster guys didn't sign and they needed some more bodies to fill their roster. So we're painting. We get done at 10 because it's raining. We go, eat, we go eat breakfast at this place I've never been to before. And one of my buddies says, oh, so what are you going to do? Um, are you going to play independent ball, which is a little bit different than Major League Baseball, but you make literally pennies? I said, no, you know, I got a degree. I'll have a degree in the fall. I student teach in the fall and start my career as a fifth grade teacher in the uh, spring of 05. That's what I'll do. They said, oh, man, that's too bad. Well, you know, if it gets nice, let's go play some golf. I said, great. So I went back home and get my golf clubs out, thinking that's going to rain, and the, and the rain never holds off. Then all of a sudden, 3 o'clock, I get a number. I get a call, and the call was from a guy, a gentleman by the name of Steve Arnieri. He's a San Francisco Giants scout. And I say his name because everybody who gets signed knows their scout. So when Ryan Braun was signed by the Brewers, a lot of stuff that you would see with Ryan Braun as the fifth pick in that draft will say he was signed by John Doe. And a lot of that, these scouts, that's how they move up. So the importance of saying, of the scouts knowing you know, whether you're good, they're, they're completely in your corner because they want you to do well. It's just like a sales. You know, if you sell this stock, you're hoping it does good because if your customer makes money, I'm going to make a little bit of money too. So Steve Arnieri called me and he said, has anybody ever talked to you about signing an undrafted uh, f a free agency deal? I said, no, you're the first. He said, well, great. I can only pay you a $1,000 signing bonus. I said, I'll give it back to you if you want. I'll just do it. <laughs> He said, you know, thanks, I love your enthusiasm, but that's what our organization has, di has decided to give for signing bonuses was $1,000. And I said, okay, what's next? You know, I'm, I'm happy as a lark, and I'm by myself. My mom's at work. So he says, well, you got to get to a fax machine. So my brother manages a, uh, a bicycle shop in Janesville. I said, well, I got it. I can have access to him. I called him. He said, well, go there. I'm going to send you some faxes. I'm gonna, you're going to print off all these contracts, you're going to sign them, date them, and then fax them right back to me, then I'll have our travel agent call you, say, can you be in Arizona tomorrow by 11? Yes, I can. <laughs> so, well, great, I'll have my travel agent call you and she'll book you a flight from Milwaukee or wherever you want to go, and you'll be in Arizona tomorrow by 11 or 12.30. So that's, that's fantastic. So that whole next couple hours were, were all kind of a blur, but I'll never forget, I've, as, as Carrie said, I have two little children. I'll never, never tell my wife this. I hope she didn't walk in. But probably the best day of my life was signing that contract. <laughs> I'll tell her it was the, the birth of our two children and the, hopefully the birth of a healthy third. But to all of you, know, between you and I, it's going to be the day I signed a, a, a contract. Um, you know, I was 20, 23 going on 24 for, for basically 20 years of my life. That's all I wanted to do was sign that contract, and I finally did it. So I'll never forget, my mom came home from work, and... I had two Miller Lights waiting for her. I said, I did it. <laughs> I, she's like, you got a job? I said, you found out where you're going to student teach? I said, no, I'm, the Giants called. I'm a professional player now. And she, of course, broke into tears like you know, any, any parent would. And just the next three hours were fantastic. And uh, the, I didn't talk about my father much, but he was diagnosed with cancer in 1999. So my college career was kind of, uh, I don't want to say marred, but it always paralleled his, his health. So the beauty of it was is that he was going through his you know, 15th round of chemotherapy or radiation. He had no hair. He's sick as a dog. And he comes over and he bought, like the, he bought the family gi Giants hats. 
So, you know, there's all these pictures of like my, you know, my dad not feeling too well, my mom happy as whatever, and the rest of us and my brothers, you know, in all these Giants gear. So that was, like I said, that was probably the best day of my life, but I won't, will never tell my wife that. So that was, uh, like I said, the pre-draft, uh, the draft, and the post-draft. And I included two pictures down here. The first one is, of course, Jackie Robinson, and the second one is just somebody I found on Google, and I have no idea who it is. But I just want to say how things really haven't changed. Like I said, when Kerry talked to me about you know, the timelessness, the, I, I kind of panicked because I'm not a historian, but I did go through it. And a lot of the, the common theme that I'm going through is that the, the story for myself is, is unique because it's me, and I'm unique from other players. But realistically, everybody that you talk to that has either been drafted first round or in the 50th, 50th round or in the, in the free agency, they probably all have a similar story as I do. So as we kind of get going into now the spring training aspect, a lot of the stuff that's taken place and a lot of the stories that I have are going to be the same for almost everybody else, but they're unique just because they're my stories. You know, and I'm sure all of you have your stories that are similar to others, but they're also their, they're your own stories. So like I said, just kind of highlight the difference you know, from when Jackie Robinson signed to the gentleman on Google Images. <laughs> so, spring training. Um, I think I was still in awe. You know, I walk into the, lo the Giants locker room and they have all this Giants logos and your name's on there and they have like X's by the Angels and the Dodgers because they don't like them. <laughs> like, you know, we had Oshkosh and lacrosse and this is real Major League Baseball teams they don't like. That's great. So, and just the rush of seeing my name with, a, with an official Giants name, with an official Giants jersey, my name on the back, and uh, going in the clubhouse and seeing some of the guys that are now playing that are all-stars making plenty of money, and I was, you know, right next to them, and they're, they're normal guys. Most of them are normal guys. Some are a little out there, but overall, they're normal. They're nice. They grew up, you know, like I said, same as me and the same as a lot of other people in the you know, Midwest or wherever it was. So, um, the the beauty of spring training is is the history. The you, you probably have seen pictures of the old Brooklyn Dodgers when they were in Vero Beach at Dodger Town, and there's 200 people doing jumping jacks. That still takes place. I don't know if it's right or if it's good, but it still takes place. You know, it's really neat to be a part of something. The schedule really hasn't changed for a long time. You know, so going down to spring training meeting with your coaches, meeting other players. That's been going on since the start. Um, the Major League Baseball draft started in 65, and I want to say the spring training probably started in the close to the 30s. You know, these clubs were new that they had to get these guys ready for the season. So overall, the history was really neat. Um, and, and there was three people that kind of, well, I guess two people with the Dodgers that really stuck out in my mind. Um, the Bill Buckner ball with the 86 World Series where it went underneath his glove and the Mets came back and won it. Well, one of our coaches was the pitcher that gave up the air to Bill Buckner. And one of the first days, somebody who's been to spring training before, he said, hey, uh, Ryan, whatever you say to Stanley, just don't talk about the 86 World Series. <laughs> so you think about that, I mean, this is 2004 and that happened in 86 and the guy still he still isn't uh, letting it go. And another cool story, uh, or another gentleman that I thought was kind of neat was, um, I'm going to butcher his last name, but Joey M. L. Fatano. He was the third base coach in the 88 World Series when Kirk Gibson hit that home run off of Dennis Eckersley when he had basically a broken ankle. And you see him you know, shaking Kirk Gibson's hands, and he's jumping up and down. And just the stories this guy had were amazing. I mean, he's been around at, at, at that time in 2004 that the third base coach of the Dodgers, who's now with the Giants, he's been around with professional baseball 60 years. And one of the coolest things I ever, I'll, I'll ever remember, I was the last person, so we had a scrimmage, and I was uh, thinking I just got done running, I was changing my cleats to, a, to regular running shoes. And he's sitting there with another gentleman who was probably about 75, 80 years old, and he just, they're just looking out, and he says, you know what? Think of all the memories this game has brought me. It's been around a long time. And all of a sudden, they just start talking about, you know, Sandy Koufax's no-hitter, Don Larson's perfect game, and I'm thinking, holy cow. You know, I was just pitching for the Whitewater Warhawks, and you guys are talking about the best players to ever play this game ever. You know, and literally, I sat there pretending to tie my shoes, but the beauty of just sitting there listening to these guys talk for 15 minutes 
about the things that they've had, the World Series, the playing, the playing with Jackie Robinson, you know, everything was amazing. So that was really a highlight of going to spring training was, like I said, just the history and a lot of the people that, you know, that, that had played, that have been around and have seen it. And Bob Stanley for giving up a, a single to Bill Buckner on an air. So that was, so once spring training gets going, um, you kind of settle into your teams. So there's about five different groups. I'll, I'll, the next slide will kind of highlight that a little bit, but you're gonna have A ball, double A, and triple A. And at the time, Major League, uh, the Major League Baseball roster, the active roster is 25. But for spring training, because they're playing so many games, they might bring 60 people to spring training. Obviously, you can't keep 60, 60 people, so there's that trickle-down effect to the minor leagues. Maybe the number one draft pick from 2003 a perk in his contract that he was going to go to spring training with the big league club. Well, that's great, but he's only a second-year player, so he's not going to make the team, so that trickles down. Then you go to AAA. Well, if that guy went down to AAA, somebody from AAA has got to go to AA, somebody from AA has got to go to A, and that somebody from A has got to go back to James, Wisconsin, or wherever they're from. So that's kind of the trickle down. So once you figure out your teams and you get more comfortable with it, the schedule's pretty standard. You wake up, they feed you breakfast, you go to the park, and you have just practice from 8 to 12. Um, many people ask what a baseball practice, what you can possibly do for four hours. I have no idea still. We were there for four hours. I don't remember what we did, but we were there for four hours. And especially pitchers, you really can't do much for four hours. We had a lot of staying, standing around. Um, maybe that's why nobody likes pitchers, because they're always screwing off, because they have nothing to do. But uh, so, but was, the beauty of it is you make friends quickly, because we had to take care of the position players. We had to shake fly balls and all that stuff. Then once, once after the first week, you get to, uh, you get to where you're kind of going to be for the regular, for the season, you hope. Then you start playing other teams. And that was really neat because you're playing a lot of the other teams and there's a lot of prospects that you've heard about. Like I said before, I thought, you know, I was a prospect, so I paid attention to the different uh, newspapers, magazines, websites that said where who was the best player that year, where they're from. So it was really neat playing a lot of the teams that were in that area. And Florida was fortunate enough, so it's basically the Florida League and then the Arizona League, and that's going to have, in Arizona where we were, we had the Rangers, Mariners, Padres, Cubs, names I can't even remember right now. But a lot of the prospects that we were, that were number one, number two picks last year, they were playing against us in spring training. And that was a lot of fun to see their names on the back of their jerseys and say, wow, he's supposed to be you know, the next Mickey Mantle or something like that. So that was really neat. Um, I brought up the Topps card, or the Topps contract. This was, besides playing baseball and signing the contract and heading down to Florida, the neatest thing about spring training is when I walked out, they said, hey, Ryan, you got to sign this contract real quick. OK, sure. It was a baseball card contract. So I got. $10 for signing a Topps baseball card contract. So I never cashed it, and I don't think I ever will, but I thought that was pretty neat. I was, a, I, was a pretty, uh, I was a pretty big card collector back, you know, when I was probably 7 to 10, 12 years old, and that was such a highlight. I think I called both my brothers. I didn't even tell my mom, like, guys, I got a, I'm a Topps baseball card guy. You don't believe me? Here's a picture. So, like I said, it was for it was for ten dollars, but it was kind of neat to sign a, a, an official contract with Topps baseball cards. So, um, I mentioned the, you know, they would give you breakfast. So spring training is extremely cheap labor, and I don't even know how they get away with it. But they, you get twenty dollars a day for three meals, and depending on what your club does, if they give you breakfast, they don't have to give you five dollars for your breakfast. If they give you lunch. They don't have to give you $5 for your lunch. If they give you dinner, they don't have to give you $10. So how the Giants did it is that they would give you lunch. Then you would get $15 to spend on your own. But the goofy part is you wouldn't get it until after lunch. <laughs> Breakfast was already over. So needless to say, my, uh, my, my credit card was not good after that. Um, but it is, it's extremely cheap labor. I mean, like I said, of course, you, you know, we're playing professional baseball and that's beautiful and it's wonderful and all, but you know, the, the trying to live on what they were paying you was, was peanuts. When considering just down the street, Barry Bonds was making $24 million a year, maybe there could have been you know, some equal pay there, but 
either way, we were all pretty happy with it. But you know, looking back and now not being as immature as I was, it's, <laughs> it's pretty crazy how cheap they, pl they pay the spring training guys. Um, we actually had to buy our, t our shorts, too. So there was another $20 expense that we had to, we had to pay for. So, um, so that was the, the Giants. The Giants spring training was, I was with the Giants for two spring trainings, my first two. And like I said, the first spring training that I was a part of, I was in awe. I mean, I don't even really remember much about it, just waking up and putting on a Giants uniform and meeting some great players, and it was a lot of fun. It was, I'll never forget that time, but like I said, it was tough to remember day to day because I think it was just all a blur because I was just in cloud nine for about two months. Um, so the Giants spring training is in Scottsdale, Arizona, a beautiful area, but it's very much different. I highlighted this, so this is the Twins, the Minnesota Twins complex, and this was taken, I think it was taken a little bit ago. So as you can see, it kind of gets from the stadium, and then there's four more, state, four more fields that get pushed back. So the stadium is for the major league guys. They don't really, they try to keep the major league and the minor league guys away a little bit. I don't know why, but I guess we were bad influences on them. So all of the minor league guys were, if I can do this. Up here was all the minor league teams, so you can tell that we didn't really get the fanfare that the, the big league club got. We kind of got the scraps in case the, if the game was sold out, they would come watch us play. But with the Giants, the big league club was about two or three miles down. A lot of you have probably been to Scottsdale area. The big league club was in Old Town Scottsdale, which is a really, really, really cool part of Scottsdale. Then the minor league club was connected to a, like a workout facility gym. And there was four people, so you would, you would literally go to spring training with the guy working out before work. It's like, it was kind of interesting, I guess. It wasn't necessarily a, a family atmosphere with the Giants. With the Twins, uh, many of you may know Terry Ryan. He's from Janesville. He's a Midwestern guy. Obviously, the Twins, be, twins being a mid, Midwestern team. A lot of those values that people say that we have, and I think we do, you could tell that with the Twins. Um, for instance, one, the stadium is right next to the Major League Club. So I was kind of half-joking about the amount of time that was spent with the major leaguers. There was one workout facility just for Twins players. And it was really neat. If you were there at the right time, you would see Joe Maurer, you would see Torrey Hunter, Johan Santana, all the guys when they were really winning the Central, those were the guys that were working out. And that was really, really cool. And a lot of those guys were extremely, extremely good people. Obviously, Maurer coming from the, from the Twin Cities. Um, Justin Morneau coming from Canada, all the, and they were fantastic. You know, they would ask your name, where you're from, what high school, college you went to, you know, word of encouragement, and they probably should because they're making a lot of money. They could, should be a little bit nicer to us, you know. <laughs> I don't think they're going to worry about a 5'11 lefty stealing their job, so. But, like I said, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a really different story uh, between the two organizations. Very kind of, you know, the Giants big league club, and then there was the minor leaguers. You know, we never really got ours. And with the Twins, it was a, it was a little bit different. Like I said, it was very, very family-oriented, and I think that's something that the ownership, uh, Carl Paulette and, and Terry Ryan, really tried to get. Um, one of the, there's a couple of cool stories. So my first year with the Twins, I actually had a tryout. So when I signed with the Twins, I really didn't even sign. I talked to Jerry, or, uh, Terry Ryan and one of their, Jim Rance, their director of uh, minor league personnel. He said, well, can you still play? Yeah, I can still play, I think. I mean, I say I can still play. So, well, why don't you come down to spring training? Okay, great. It'll be a tryout. So I think I was off of my parents' insurance, and I signed a waiver saying that if I get hurt, <laughs> they don't have to pay for anything. Again, I was immature then. I was just excited to be there. But I'm thinking, you know, I probably had 20 appearances, probably pitched 40 innings in spring training. I could have definitely taken a comebacker off the head. Well, that's on me now because <laughs> I signed a letter saying that I'm not going to sue them if I get hurt. So I made the team. One, another cool day. It was the last day of spring training. Um, I'm kind of getting antsy, figuring out if I get a, get a plane ticket back home or if I'm going to stick around there. So I made the team. And my locker partner kind of next to me. It was a guy by the name of Bud Smith. And during the course of spring training with the twins, this guy would just get boxes of mail. And I thought I was small. This kid was probably this tall, probably five foot seven, five foot eight. But he would just get boxes of fan mail. And he would literally sit in his cubby for hours just signing autographs, signing autographs. And finally I said, Bud, you know, let's go have a beer tonight. 
said, all right, well, where do you want to go? I said, there's a little little shack by the hotel. We'll just go there and you know have a couple beers and head back home, be home by 9 o'clock because we had bed checks at 10. I said, all right. So I said, bud, what's, what's, what's your story, man? He goes, well, I was, uh, I was drafted by the Cardinals, and I was the youngest person ever to throw a no-hitter. Oh. That would explain why you're getting all this fan mail. <laughs> well, I'm Ryan. I've uh, never been in the major leagues. I haven't made out a rookie ball, and here, here we are. So needless to say, he was, <laughs> it was interesting to hear him talk about some of his stories, playing with Albert Pujols and you know, being managed by Tony Arusa. So the next day, I said, hey, let me see some of those cards. So he showed me some of the cards, and he uh, showed me some of the, the fan mail that he receives, and it is, it's pretty funny. You know, people, 10 year old bud, I'm your biggest fan. I'm sorry about your arm, and please sign my you know, card or my baseball, whatever it is. And you know, they're always good about sending it back, and it's, 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 it's pretty neat. Um, with the twins, like I said, I was very much more family oriented, so there's always fans that were kind of walking in and out. And uh, <clears throat> every day, you know, sign probably 20, 30 baseballs or pieces of paper or spring training programs with your name on it. So, needless to say, I thought I was, I was pretty cool at the time. Um, they didn't know that I wasn't a prospect anymore, but you know it was neat signing all that stuff. So that was kind of my my neat story with the Twins was playing uh, or being in a locker mate next to Bud Smith. I guess the the end of the story is that he was cut because he hurt his arm and he's never been able to come back. So, but he still is the youngest player to ever throw a no hitter in Major League Baseball. So, um, so now, like I said before, we're breaking up into teams, and it is a total trickle down effect. So once the big league club starts to get down to the dwindle of their 25 active roster, the AAA will get all of a sudden, they'll have 35 players, and they can only have 25 as well. So the trickle down goes all the way down. And you're always a little fearful, but you kind of know where you're at. Um, and I say that there's really no total clues, but if you're starting a game, you're probably pretty safe. If you're relieving a game, about a 50-50 shot. And if you're not pitching, you're probably not going to make the team. So I was relieving. So I thought I had a 50-50 shot. Um, I was throwing pretty hard. I was getting guys out. Um, a lot of positive feedback from my pitching coach and the uh, minor league pitching coordinator, um, who always said he went to Whitewater College, which I never corrected because I was OK with that. As long as he knew the city that I was in, that's fine. Um, so I. With the, with the, let me get back, backtrack a little bit. So now we're, we break teams with the Giants, and I get stuck in rookie ball. Rookie ball is 50 people. The average age is 18 and a half, and I was 23 at the time. So needless to say, I was, didn't think I was mature, but boy, I was far more mature than the people that were there. So rookie ball is filled with a lot of the people that played in the Venezuelan Summer Leagues or the Dominican Summer Leagues. These kids might even be 16 years old and they're professional baseball players. They were really good. Um, I played with, played with Pablo Sandoval. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He's, uh, he was with the Giants for a while, won some World Series, and now he's with the Red Sox and he's making a lot of money not doing anything. But we're in the outfield, and he's from the Dominican Republic. We're in the outfield and I'm shaking a ball before the, before the game starts. And Pablo says, hey, Kelly, let me see the ball. Let me throw it in. So I throw him the ball, he grabs my glove, and he throws just an absolute line drive to second base left-handed. Kind of look at him and said, Pablo, what's up, man? You're a righty, but you throw lefty. He goes, well, I grew up lefty. So, <laughs> so you grew up lefty, and now you can throw 90 righty. There's something in the water in the Dominican Republic that allows you guys to play baseball. Because I don't have it. I don't know what it is, but I don't have it. I have the drive, I just don't have the ability. He said, well, when he was, uh, I think he said 10 or 12 years old, a scout came up to his family and said, just so you know, Pablo's very good, but he's five foot seven, 200 pounds. He's not gonna be anything. He's not gonna be a pitcher. He can't play outfield, he's too short. He's gotta be a catcher. So, taught himself how to throw right-handed. Now he's in the Major League Baseball throwing right-handed. So that was the whole, wow, these guys are good moment for me, was watching a righty throw a baseball, lefty, 200 feet on a line. That definitely put back my confidence a little bit after I saw that. So. Um, so then I was in rookie ball. I was stuck there, and I was having a pretty good season. And this, at this time, I was a starter. And about halfway through the season, uh, the manager called me in his office. And I didn't think it was going to be bad. 
I thought it might be, you know, hey, you're working hard, here's something that we got to work on. He goes, oh, congratulations, you're going up to low A. So that was fantastic. So the day that I got called up, of course, I call my family and we're pretty excited and, you know, they're pretty excited and my dad just bought two plane tickets, so he's down $800 to Arizona. But the day that I got called up, we got called up to Hagerstown, Maryland. So Hagerstown, Maryland was the low A team for the San Francisco Giants. The day that I got called up was Willie Mays Day. So I thought, what luck is that? I get to fly into Baltimore. They paid a $400 cab ride from Baltimore to Hagerstown, which is pretty wild. They won't give us t-shirts or shorts, but they'll pay for a $400 cab ride. But uh, walk in the locker room, and this team was horrible. They were, I think at the time, they were like the worst team in major league, or minor league baseball. So of course you walk in, and everybody's pretty depressed just because they're bad, and they want to they get home for the summer. So I walk in, happy as a clam, thinking, this is the greatest thing in the world. I'm moving up. I'm going to be the majors next year. Well, like I said, they were pretty bad, so you kind of, <laughs> they rub off on you a little bit about the negativity. So the manager calls a, a meeting in the clubhouse, and they say, just so you guys know, Willie Mays is going to be here. His daughter is his chauffeur, and he'll sign two objects for you, and he doesn't want to do a speech in front of you all, but what he prefers is questions. So the manager kind of gave us a heads up on what to expect. So sure enough, Willie Mays comes in with his daughter into the clubhouse, and um, we all gave, we, I think the manager, the, the league gave us like two balls apiece, so I got a couple of Willie Mays balls, and that was, that was really special. So Willie Mays comes in, and he kind of gave us the same speech that our manager said. I don't, I don't want to talk about my career. I want all of you to ask me questions. So there are some good questions, you know, what, who was the best pitcher you faced, um, which I don't remember anymore. Some other good questions, and then some gentleman from uh, California who was about six foot seven, 250 pounds. He said, Willie, do you think with all of the supplements that are out there today, you could have hit 800 home runs? And you could tell Willie was thinking, he said, son, center field in four parks I played at were 580 feet. If I played today, I could hit 800 home runs. <laughs> so needless to say, the, everybody looked at the guy and said, God, you're such an idiot. So, I think for the next 25 days, I never let it down. Like, why would you ask Willie Mays about, you know, creatine and steroids and stuff? But, like I said, that was the first day I called up. So, I think I, uh, I kind of hit the jackpot on the, the day I got called up. And I guess the, the sad part about it is it was Willie Mays, days because, or Willie Mays Day because he just came out with a book and he called Hagerstown, Maryland, the most racist town he ever played in. So, it was a bad time for that, but I guess being a young guy coming up, I got to meet Willie Mays and get two balls signed by him. You know, it was, it was pretty special. And if you ever go to Hagerstown, Maryland, which I don't think you ever will be, and if you do, I don't know what you're going to do there, but it's still Willie Mays Way. And there, I was there the day they renamed it Willie Mays Way in front of the stadium. So, but that was pretty neat. Uh, Hagerstown, like I said, it's, it's, it's a blue collar industrial town. The, uh, the fence was, I think three quarters of it was brick. I mean, that's not too popular today, especially with the outfielders and the pads and everything, but it was a re really neat experience being there. Rookie ball isn't really minor league baseball. It is, but you're not, you're not getting the atmosphere. You know, you're playing during the day a lot. Once you go to Hagerstown, you get some of those, you get some fireworks nights where you might get eight, ten thousand 10,000 people for you, you know, in front of it. Um, you're starting to get, you know, some of the prospects that you heard about, some of the guys that you want to that you want to be like or hopefully uh, you know pass up so that was a lot of fun um, that first year I think we ended up finishing like 38 and 102 so we didn't win too many more games I was not I was not the cure for their their losing problems but it was a lot of fun we uh, the last game this season was in Lexington and uh, my parents were fortunate enough to come down with my brothers and some friends to see me play in, in Lexington and the the coolest part it was the Louisville Kentucky football game and they played it on like the jumbotron. So I think we actually had more people that wanted to see the Kentucky game against Louisville <laughs> rather than see the, the old Hagerstown Suns at 38 and 101 at the time because we did lose that game too. So, um, <clears throat> As far as the, the pay goes, so I, I always said cheap labor in spring training it gets almost just as bad as when you, when you sign your first deal in your first year. Because the minor league baseball isn't, isn't paid off of where you're drafted. The number one draft pick for the, the Giants signed for 850000 We were on Hagerstown together. Him and I made the same monthly, 
uh, salary. It was $950. So, and that sounds okay. I mean, when I was painting houses, that was fine. When I didn't have to pay rent in my mom's house. But here, you had to pay for rent. My student loans I was trying to stay up on top of. Um, the other part that people forget is you have a clubby. Every, every clubhouse has a clubby. The clubby gives you food. The clubby makes sure your uniforms are washed. The clubby will do just normal tasks. He'll pick up some stuff. He'll kind of pack stuff up before the, bay, before the bus leaves. But that's $3 a day. In, Major League, in minor league baseball, you play 140 games in 150 days. That's a lot of days, and that's a lot of money to spend to send to somebody who's washing a uniform, which is great. I'm not saying I don't agree with it, but you multiply that by the cost of housing, by the cost of living. You got to pay for your own food, and Lord, no, you better find somebody with a car, because the team's not going to pick you up from the apartment that you're staying at, or you better find it close enough where you can walk. So these are all the things that I learned my first year, that nobody ever really told you about. Like, yeah, you're playing, you're a professional baseball player. You can go anywhere and say that you play for the Giants. You can also go anywhere and talk to the clerk at wherever and say, you make more than me, and I'm a baseball player. So it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't about the money. It was, you know, obviously you're, you're doing something you have a passion for, but it definitely got tight, and again, my credit card continued to grow and grow and grow for the next three years, actually. So transition over to, to my time with the Fort Myer for the, with the Twins. After two years with the Giants, I eventually got released in December. And I kind of knew it was coming. I was, I was staying in the same league. Um, they kind of bumped me from starter to reliever to, to spot reliever, which is a fancy term for saying, well, we're getting blown out. Why don't you go in? Um, so then, like I said, I met with Terry Ryan, and I got a chance to try for the Twins. And the last day of the season, I was placed in high A. So now I'm pretty confident, saying, OK, I'm moving up. I'm a lefty. I'm throwing pretty hard. I've gotten a little bit bigger. Now I'm with the age group that I should be with. I was 25 at the time. Everybody else was 25 or 26 at the time. So now I'm with my comfort level. A lot of these young men were, if they were Dominican or Latin Americans, they were probably in the States for five or six years. They spoke fluent English. Um, they knew the game. You could conversate with them. You could live with them. A couple of them were my, my roommates. And then you also had the American-born players who more often than not were going to colleges so it was, it, was, it was a really nice mix, um, mixture of uh, diversity of people. Um, I always said, whenever somebody says, what's the most diverse environment you had, I said, it's Major League Baseball. I mean, when I played in 2004, 45% of the population of all minor league players were non-American born players. And that's diversity right there. You know, so it's, although I grew up in Janesville and it's kind of Midwestern and it's, it's not the most diverse place, I was able to spend four years in an environment where, where English was not the, the first language spoken. It was primarily Spanish. And a lot of the American-born players to, I don't know if it's add to their marketability, but a lot of them were working on speaking Spanish. And I took five years of Spanish through high school and one in college, and I loosely conversate with them, but I don't know. They are probably saying stuff behind my back either way. So, But no, it was, it was, it was an interesting time. So Florida, I was fortunate to play in, in Arizona in the summer, which is not cold, extremely, extremely hot. And I was fortunate enough to play in Fort Myers, Florida in the summer. So when people say it's a dry heat in Arizona and there's a lot of humidity in Florida, no, they're both horrible. <laughs> don't, don't, don't let anybody ever tell you that. If, oh yeah, go to, go to Arizona in the summer, it's, it's dry. Yeah, it's 110. It's dry, but it's 110. So, yeah, we were, I mean, it was, it was tough just to stay hydrated being, you know, going out because batting practice would start. We have to report to the field and with both clubs around 3 o'clock. Batting practice would be from 4 to 5. You're outside from 3 to 5. It's still pretty darn hot. Then your game's at 7.05, and we we're pushing 94 degrees still in Florida with 100% humidity. Um, probably the... The, the least favorite memory I have of, of all my professional experiences uh, involves snakes. I'm uh, scared of snakes. I mean, I would, if you, somebody had a snake, I'd probably faint. So we, my roommate and I had a condo, and he was from Las Vegas, which is a whole other topic that I can probably talk about four hours on, the different lifestyles we ran. But uh, our motion detector the first week was really good. It, it worked. It was perfect. So we'd park, park his truck. It'd be 11 o'clock after the game. 
the motion detector would be go on and it would be okay. Then all of a sudden the motion detector got a little sketchy. We would have to be like 10 feet from it. Well, once you get to 10 feet, you see like four snakes slithering back, back and forth. So I'm screaming, yelling obscenities. I'm going back in the truck like I'm not even going in. So of course, being the mature adults that we are, we don't even replace it. We just say, we just suck it up. Well, then we get to the point where it doesn't even work. So now we got about 60 games left and my motion detector doesn't work and there's snakes all over the damn place. So I can just hear them slithering through the grass as they hear us coming. So I made sure to make plenty of noise and try to vibrate the ground because I hear that's how they hear. So um, <laughs> needless to say, it was, it was horrible for about two, uh, probably about a month and a half. We'll say 45 days, it was, it was hard. Especially after our road trips when the snakes probably get comfortable that we were gone for 10 days, like nobody's coming back. But you know, if that's the worst that it was, it was, it was a pretty good run, so. Um, <clears throat> so these are the, different, the, the three different teams that I played on and the different or, if, uh, organizations. One thing that's, that's unique is, although it's Major League Baseball and you have the American League and the National League, it's kind of the same with the, with the minor leagues. So if you talk to somebody who played minor league baseball and you said, oh, I was in the Eastern League, well, they're going to know it's double A with a certain number of teams. If I was in the uh, Pacific Coast League, they'll know that it's in the triple A. So the, the leagues that I stayed, that I played with, the Arizona League. So like the Arizona League, like I said, it was hard. You know, I was going to be a college graduate. I was playing with 18-year-olds, many of which did not speak English. And the people that did speak English just graduated high school, so you can probably imagine the different likes that we have from a 23-year-old and a 24-year-old and an 18-year-old. So that was hard. Now, the neat thing about Arizona was being in Arizona. Um, like I said, it was hot, but we saw some really, really neat parts of the, the Southwest. Um, we'd only get a day off or two. There's an all-star break where it's just the same as a Major League Baseball. You get three days off. And we went to Flagstaff and camped in some open campground with the with a mountain with still snow, you know, snow camp mountain behind us. It was gorgeous. I mean, one of the things that I want to do in a lot of the, the, the places that I traveled, I want to take my family there because it was so neat. And it didn't matter whether we were playing baseball or not. It was just a really, really special thing. So the beauty of the Arizona League is that you're close to everything. Arizona, the spring training for the Giants is technically called the Cactus League. So your longest car ride from team to team is going to be about two and a half hours. We never had to stay at another hotel. Um, we, you know, came back after every game. Uh, Scottsdale was a really neat place to live. Um, I always thought Scottsdale was kind of fantasy land. We stayed next to a, a what was it, the Fashion Square Hotel. Um, we saw Michael Jordan there. We saw Derek Jeter there. Mike Tyson would go there. This was a pretty happening place for a lot of people that, that were uh, within the entertainment or professional athletes, uh, some famous people. So. <clears throat> that was kind of fantasy land. I don't think a lot of people really knew what they had. And, but it was a good experience, and, and being in Arizona was kind of neat. We never made it to the Grand Canyon, but uh, we did say some pretty, pretty neat parts of it. The Hagerstown Suns were in the South Atlantic League. The South Atlantic League is not South Atlantic. It should be all over the East Coast. That's what it should be called. Because <laughs> our bus rides were upwards of 19 hours long. So it's not Southern Atlantic. It's all over. You're playing by Cleveland, you're playing by Lexington, you're going up to Hagerstown, you're going all the way down to Augusta, Georgia, Rome, Georgia. I mean, you are everywhere. And it was neat. You know, I think at the time, obviously, everybody, nobody really wanted to be in a bus for more than a couple hours, but when you really had some time to self-reflect and say, what am I doing? I'm going from Augusta, Georgia, where we drove by the master's course. That was really cool. I don't know if any of you like golf, but I thought that was neat, you know. You couldn't really see in it, but the bus driver said, oh, and there's the Masters. It was there. I mean, I don't know if I saw a green or not, but it was, it was, it was pretty cool to know that that was right there. Um, and just the history. The history of the southeastern part of the United States was, was really, really neat. Going through the Blue Ridge Mountains at 6 a.m., I'll never forget that. And, a, and a huge, I mean, if, if you're going to go through those mountains, what would you rather have, a huge coach bus with huge windows? It was gorgeous. You know, everywhere we went, the landscape in the bus, unless it was at night, of course, was amazing. And again, like I said, my, my father was sick at the time. He actually passed away while I was playing with Fort Myers. And I can, it's an interesting story, kind of sad, but interesting story. Talk about that in a second. He came out there and visited me a couple of times. We went to Gettysburg, we went to Antietam, 
I mean, we saw some pretty, pretty, pretty powerful things that really, really, you know, shaped our country the way it is today. So I think that was the beauty of playing in the South Atlantic League was just the, just the see the the seeing that that part of the country. I don't know if I would ever go to the southeast or southwest part of the country, but I had to. I was getting paid and I was playing baseball and I got to be a tourist as well. But overall, the league was. If you ever been to a Bloyd Snappers game, the South Atlantic League is a lot like that. <clears throat> you wouldn't get a ton of fans unless there was fireworks. Um, you get a couple. Trust me, we knew that. You wanted to play on firework night, so you're going to play in front of some fans. But uh, everything was old and it was neat. Like I said, Willie Mays, his first professional stop was at Hagerstown, and also he said it was uh, you know the most racist town. So there's a lot of things that took place. We were, um, I think we were about five miles from the Mason Dixon line. That's where I stayed. Um, but it was, it was a neat experience in the South Atlantic League, just for that, not only baseball, but just the history aspect. Then the last place I played was the Florida State League. That was, the beauty of the Florida State League is that you play at everybody's major league spring training uh, stadiums. So although we might only had 200 people, we were playing where 14,000 could have been. It was really, really neat. The, the fields were pristine because, of course, the big leaguers were there for two months, so it has to be the best of the best. So the Florida State League, which I never knew this was a category, but was rated the best place to play for field, for the, the playing surfaces. And it was, it was, it was pretty cool. Um, it, was, it, was an, like, it was hot, but playing and going in the locker rooms, knowing that you know, some of your favorite players that are still playing Major League Baseball today, like this, it could have been their locker. You know, I was still young enough where that was really neat. And I, don't, I guess you never outlived that. That's, that's pretty cool. Um, and that, that had a lot of history as well. I think over the last 10 years, a lot of the teams that were in the Florida State League or in the, uh, I think it's called the Grapefruit League, have really gone away from some of their original homes. Um, the Cincinnati Reds were in Sarasota. Now I think they're out in Arizona. But the Sarasota Reds, when you went there, it was so cool to see Johnny Bench, you know, all those guys, all their names right behind the dugout. Um, it was really, really neat to play in some of those places. And it was neat to, back to the, you know, being a tourist, we played the Daytona Cubs. So we came in right next to the Daytona racetrack. And growing up, my dad used to take me to the Jefferson racetrack and a couple other things. And that's what I always assumed that racing was, you know, something like that. Then you go to the Daytona 500 and you realize that it's like four miles long. I mean, like, hey guys, look, there's a Daytona 500 track. Still there? You know, five minutes and you're finally past this track. It's, it's, it's amazing. So, and I did go to a NASCAR race in Phoenix. I forgot to tell you about that. That was a pretty interesting experience coming from the Midwest. Um, but like I said, the Florida State League was, it was a lot of fun to play at some of these big league parks. Um, and it was just a, a neat part of Florida because we were always in the coast. So we were never in the middle, which is, I don't wish that upon anybody to live in the middle of Florida. But... The coasts are gorgeous. You know, we played in Vero Beach, we played in Sarasota, Fort Myers, Clearwater, all those places. They're, they're nice towns. And it was a lot of fun because a lot of our housing was on the beach. Who wants to stay on the beach in the summer besides us? So, I mean, we, when we played in Daytona, my roommate and I had a, had a two bedroom condo with a kitchen. You know, you try to rent that in March and you're probably paying about $3,000. I think we paid like 40 bucks a night for it. Because nobody wants to be there. You know, those places are ghost towns in the summer. So, so that was the last place I played was the, the Florida State League. So those are the three leagues that I played in. Um, the, last, the last slide that I have is just as far as playing goes. So this is Dodger Town. I made a comment that a lot of these older town, a lot of these older spring training gowns are being, they're being upgraded, just like K uh, County Stadium to Miller Park. And, you know, you see why. It's a, it's a fan base revenue, and you want to get the most fans as well as gives your people the most uh, opportunity to succeed. So this was, and I brought this up for a number of reasons. My dad sent me a book called The Last Good Season. It's about the 56 Dodgers and their departure from Brooklyn to L.A. and uh, O'Malley and Branch Rickey, and it's, it's really, really neat. So I got to start the game before this, and I was a reliever, so I got a spot start. So my pitching coach said, all right, you're starting the game before this, and then we're, we're going to Vero Beach. So once you get to Vero Beach, you've got to go for a long run. And this is when I'm about three-quarters of the way through the book, and all of everything that is in the book, I'm there now. You know, they're talking about, 
you know, Duke Snyder and all these other guys staying in these cabins. And I'm running past them because I got my conditioning after I started as a 45 minute run. So it's great. I'm going through, I'm, I'm literally walking through history in Dodger Town. Uh, through here, you can't see it because it's gone. They actually had an 18 hole golf course. So if you think about, the Dodgers were extremely instrumental in what they wanted. They want to have complete control over their players. When they're there for spring training, they want to monitor what they ate, they wanted to monitor where they slept, and they even wanted to monitor their free time. So in the book, it talks about a lot of these famous, you know, old Dodgers playing golf. And it was still there when I was there. It wasn't, it wasn't a golf course, but you could still tell the cuts. So I'm going through, I'm running through the, uh, the, st the player housing. I'm running through the 13 holes that I can still tell that are golf courses. It's amazing. And now it's, it, this is gone. Now the Dodgers have since moved to greener pastures where it's more friendly. So like I said, I think I, this is the last slide that I have just because this one always brings me back the most memories as far as you know, reading the last good season about the Brooklyn Dodgers and having the ability to run for 45 minutes through the entire complex and just saying, oh my gosh, that's where Jackie Robinson was. You know, that's where Duke Snyder was. So I, uh, if you've never read the book, I encourage it. It's a really good read. And the, it's one of the topics in there is about the stadium getting built in Brooklyn and moving to LA. And it's a lot of it's the same public financing dilemmas that we face today with our, with our uh, major sports. And it's, it's a really, it's an easy read. It's a good read. And uh, hopefully you'll think of Dodger Town as you're reading it. So that's about, that's all I got. So any questions or? Time for just a, one or two brief questions. We'll go here. <laughs> Would you make a comment on the, your experience with the coaching in the uh, minor leagues in terms of developing your skills? Uh, it's 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 different from organization to organization. I think uh, I don't know if that's mine or yours. <laughs> the with the Giants it was very much if you're good, you're good, and you're going to make it. There wasn't a ton of coaching. Um, with the Twins, it was very much all right, you're this good, I think we can develop you a little bit more. And I think that's why the Twins are always had such a strong farm system is that they were able to develop their players. Where a lot of the teams like the Giants and probably the Yankees, what you got is what you got. You just hope that they succeed. So it's, it varied from, from level to level, coach to coach, and then from organization to organization. So 